It is wonderful to be together. It is wonderful to have Thomas back. It's wonderful to see in June, in the summer, and look at us. We're growing. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, praise the Lord. Uh, and so much, so much. So, we're going to jump. Oh, yeah. We're going to jump in and we're going to go fast. Okay. So, in this parasha, we do see so much about obedience. Obedience. Walk in my statutes, commandments. Perform them. But God doesn't say do it for nothing. He's very generous. Amen. We will receive material blessings. Amen. He's speaking to the children of Israel at that time. He's telling them they will dwell securely in the promised land. Wow, I think they'd give something for that today. Amen. The Lord himself said, I'll dwell with you. I'll walk among you. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And even calls them his peculiar treasure is what it means in the English. And I always think, oh, He's got a few pearls. <laughs> if you didn't get that one, let it go. <laughs> he also brought to their attention disobedience. If they disregard his commandments, if they are covenant breakers, there are consequences. And that's only fair, right, just, you know, that is the way it should be. So he had warned them that there would be all manner of distresses, that they would have all kinds of issues in their lives. And I'm not going to say if you have these issues that that means you're being disobedient, because it's not that. But he can guarantee, you can be guaranteed if you're disobedient, you are going to suffer physically, you're going to suffer heartache, you're going to suffer, Soros is our word in, in half Yiddish, half Hebrew, troubles, oi, troubles. Uh, he said your enemies, They'll eat your increase. Yep. Do you know what that means? You're going to plant, you're going to do all the work, and when the crop's ready to come in and you get the benefit of it, your enemy's going to get it. That's not something we want to have happen. And more than that, they're not only going to eat your bounty, but those who hate you are going to rule over you. If you think about that one with our world conditions today, that takes on a new heaviness to it. You're going to flee in terror. You're going to be full of fear. You're going to be miserable. Now, if somebody comes and tells you, here's your path to blessing, and here's your path to terror and misery, fear, <laughs> it doesn't seem to me that it would be hard to know which side you want to be on. But God knew his people, and he told them, I've got to add on one more to this, because if you still don't return to the Lord. And that's the whole purpose of why he allows you to have those consequences is to turn you back around and get you to look to him and get in right relationship with him. And he warned them, if you don't, I'm going to let you be exiled. You're going to be kicked out of the land of milk and honey. You're going to find yourself banished. And when you're banished from the land, you're being banished from my presence. That's the heaviest one of all. That's, we talk about how we feel his presence here in our worship and, and in our time in the word. Wow. Wow. But nonetheless, despite all the warnings, he said, you're going to be disobedient. God knows. You know, you don't hide anything from God, and you can't fool God. And he knows, and he knew ahead of time. And he said, I know this will happen, and I know you'll go into captivity. But you know what he never said? He never said, I'll leave you there. He never said, I'm done with you. He never said, and it's all over. You're not mine. To the contrary, he says, my love and my mercy, I'll never fully depart from you. And when you humble your heart and when you turn back, I'm right there. I'll forgive your iniquity. When we read in our parsha in Ephiakra, uh, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 42, he's saying, when you turn back to me with your heart, he says, I'm going to remember. He doesn't say, I'm going to remember all you did and drag that out. No, to the contrary, he says, I'm going to remember the covenant I made with Abraham, the covenant I made with Yitzhak, the covenant I made with Yaakov, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He starts with Jacob. Okay. Jacob. Okay. Yes, she's right. She's right. Then I will remember my covenant with Yaakov and my covenant with Yitzhak and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember 
the land. And that goes all the way back. That's, I'm glad he has a good memory of the good. <laughs> and in verse 44 he says, in spite of this, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so loathe them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. No, for I'm the Lord, their God. He's the faithful one. And I want to remind everyone today who thinks that Israel, it's done, it's over, and they're replaced. But the question is, how are they going to be obedient? How do they do that? Of course, we can apply how do we do it. And by the way, if you didn't get it the first time, when we get to Dalvarim, to Deuteronomy chapters 30 through 32, we're going to go through this all over again because he lays it all out there too. He, God tells Moshe. Moshe is about ready to pass the baton on to Yeshua. And he tells them, here's your history. Here's what you've done. Here's what you're doing. Here's what you're going to do. And he tells them, don't, when you get into the land, forget God. But you're going to. <laughs> Just, and it isn't that they are defeated because they hear that. It's that God's saying, no surprises. I know your human condition. I know the need, and I'm not going to walk away from you. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give you that book of the law. That book of the law is going to testify against you. If he didn't give them the law, then he can't hold them accountable. That isn't fair. If you don't know that this is the rule, then you don't know that you're breaking it. That's not fair. But God has to give it to them. And he has to give it to them with righteousness and with justice and with holiness because that's who he is. And that's what the law is meant to be. It's not meant to be a burden. It's not meant to be a hardship. It's not meant to be impossible. And in fact, before we end, and if I forget, someone remind me to say it because God tells us how to do it. Mm -hmm. But right now at this point, we see all this. We know that the, the diaspora of today and we Jewish people in this room are living proof there's still a diaspora today because we're not in our homeland. And that's going to go on. It's going to happen even though he's giving them all these ways to be obedient and not have that happen. He's going to give more vows, more how to tithe for the sanctuary, how to dedicate everything from their animals to their people to their houses everything and then it emphatically ends with verse 46 and at verse 46 he just simply says it these are the statutes and the ordinances and the laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moshe on Mount Sinai fact fact today they want no facts God said it. This is it. So I'm going to ask you, well, then what help? I can hear the people saying, how? How are we going to do this? What do we do? Very interesting. I love God's timing. You all know that. I love to speak on his timing. It comes out time and time and time again because God is in our timing. And we are coming right up. That's why I knew that we're at, at day 39. We're coming up to the 40th day in the Count of Thomer. Sundown Saturday night to sundown Sunday night will be the 40th day. It's very interesting that that's in our time when this is what our attention has been brought to, these scriptures. It's coinciding with what's called Mem Ba'omer. And that's just simply Mem is a letter in the al fate that has the value of 40. So it's the 40th day counting the Omer. So when you see that name, now you know why. So why does that mean anything to me? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> 40 in scripture gives us divine judgment or testing or trial. How can I get that? 40 years in the wilderness. Failure. They didn't stay faithful to God, and they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Prior to that, we've got 40 days of rain in the days of Noah. The flood came, 40 days and 40 nights. And I could put a big failure up there again. 40 days on Mount Sinai. Moshe is up there. Golden calf. Really? <laughs> failure, <laughs> failure, trials and testings and failure and failure and failure. But I want to take you to another 40 in scripture. Okay. 
We've got 40 days of fasting. Mm -hmm. We have it done by Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And right after, he goes into a trial, mm -hmm. a testing, when Satan, Satan, comes mm -hmm. to him. And there I say, success! <laughs> no failure there. Now why was Yeshua successful? And why are the others not? And where does that put us? And I take us back to the Brit Chadashah. I take us to Luke 4. We read in Luke 4 last week, but a little earlier in verse 1 it says, Then Yeshua, filled with the Ruch HaKodesh, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the garden and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He didn't go into that trial by accident. No. And we don't go into our trials no. by accident right. either. And our trials are not meant to bring us to failure, but they are meant to bring us to success. Yes. So we look at him. In verse 14, it says, Yeshua returned to the Galil in the power of the Spirit. You know what happened between 1 and 14? the great temptation of Yeshua mm. that came against him in every avenue of life. And he answered with the word of Amen. God every time. Yeah. He stopped Satan in his tracks by the word of God. Right. And he did it at a time that the flesh was to the point of starvation. Mm. Because they say at day 40, starvation sets in. Mm. And your body starts dying from the starvation. So here he is, comes out of this time in such great success by the power of the Holy Spirit, led by the Ruch HaKodesh, and that's where he went into that synagogue in Nazareth that we talked about last week. That's when he picked up, the, or they handed him the scroll of Yeshua of Isaiah, where he read, and I'll give you the verses again, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Wow. Wow. Was the Spirit of the Lord upon yes. him? Oh, yes, because he anointed me. Yes. He anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives. And I think of our hostages every time I read captives. He came to release them. And recovery of sight to the blind. Some of us have had eye surgery. We know what that really means and the gift of eyesight. Wow. To set those free who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, of Adonai. And that's where I said, remember, that's where he stopped. He stopped mid-sentence. He didn't finish it to the end of the sentence or the end of the verse because there was something very poignant that he was saying, and I brought it out last week, that there was going to be this gap of time because the next phrase talks about the day of the vengeance of God. And that was not at this time. This time was the favorable year of the Lord. So he had to stop there. He stopped there because he, that's what his life was revealing, was that this is the time. This is not the time of that vengeance. This is not the time of God's wrath being poured out. This is the time when I've come to release and to heal and to save. And Yeshua's life is so powerful. We don't see a weakling. We don't see one inferior. We don't see him struggle against anything that came to him. In fact, on the contrary, we see him healing and helping everywhere he went. But we know that, that earthly life culminated in death. But it didn't stop there, did it? They buried him. And I'm sure the enemies thought victory. But power came into that picture. The power of the resurrection life. That's powerful. That's the power that raised that human body from the dead. That's the power that we read about in Scripture. How was he raised from the dead? He was raised from the dead by the Spirit of God. The, the, God the Father and the Spirit of God raised the human form of Yeshua and Jesus. And when we see that power, we know what that power is and what it's talking about. Even if I take it from the Greek and not the Hebrew, we know that some say it's the word dynamite, but actually it's even better to say it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. That's what it really yes. means. Now take that into Romans 1.16. And here shall Paul say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, Amen. for it's the power oh, right. of God. That's, right. That's the power to resurrect lives, right. to bring back from the dead, to open eyes, right. to set the captives free. 
that's power and that's for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew but also to the Greek no one's left out Greek means Gentile in that case it's everybody else but notice in that verse also just as a side note but don't miss it in that verse we see the triunity of our God because in other scriptures is quoted that it's the power of the Spirit here it's saying it's the power of God. We know scripture does not disagree with itself. So if it's telling you it's the spirit of God or it's the spirit himself, we know it's one and the same. Yeah. And it's speaking about it interacting in the life of Yeshua because he was God the Son. Yeah. We have our triunity in our salvation in one verse that says power, power. We have no right to be weaklings, folks. We have no right to struggle. We've got power available to us. We have power that God's just dying to ooze into your body and let it eke out. That's what he wants to do. And it doesn't stop here. If I stopped here, I'm stopping short of the complete story. Everybody thinks, well, that's it. Death, burial, resurrection. And I'll say hallelujah to all that, but that's not the end. Right. Remember, we're talking about 40. We're coming up to day 40. Something very important happens on day 40. This is the 40th day since he resurrected. And this is mighty powerful. Mm -hmm. This is eyewitnessed. Mm -hmm. This isn't hearsay. This is eyewitnessed. Some of these who eyewitnessed it saw the resurrection. Saw, well, they saw the after effect. They didn't see him raised, but they saw that he was raised. But what happened on the 40th day? What happened on Mem but of Mer? I think I'm hearing it. He ascended. Mm -hmm. He ascended. This is when he was going to go up into heaven. Now think about it. He knows this is his last message with them. This is the last time he's going to be talking with them. If you knew that you were going to be leaving your beloved and you knew you were their leader, and you knew that you were empowering them, you'd been guiding them, you'd been leading them, you'd been directing them, you'd been living it out in front of them. Your last words are going to be very important to them. Very important. And he's going to be a good leader because he's going to leave them instruction. But again, let me remind you, and by the way, I love this fact too. When we hit that 40th day, the way we always say it is we say it in weeks and days. It happens to be five weeks and five days. And what is five in scripture? Grace. Grace. Grace, grace of our God. Grace of our Lord. You would say, well, how is it grace? He's leaving them. Because he says, if I go. You all are ahead of me. The Spirit will come. The Spirit's going to indwell each one of you individually. You know, Yeshua can find himself in a body. He was in one place at one time. <coughs> the Spirit doesn't confine Himself, and He's able to be in all that are open to Him. So we have really the ascension being the crescendo. This is the completion. He, he lived, died, buried, rose, and ascended. And it's very important that He did ascend because we see power in that ascension. You know, they tried to say, he didn't raise. He could have just simply disappeared off of the scene, and it would fit right in. Oh, yeah, see, they hid his body somewhere. But he doesn't do that in front of an audience who can give eyewitness account. He shows them his leaving. He doesn't just magically disappear. <laughs> and I'm taking you to Acts 1. And the description of Yeshua there, what he did and what he taught is given to us by the book of, or by the author of Luke. And a lot of people want to say he's Gentile, but I think we've got ourselves a Hellenistic yeah. Jew here. I think there's at least part, if not more than that. We can argue that another day. No one can be 100% because scripture doesn't say it, but it just seems mighty strange that the whole book is Jewish. Yes. Jewish from beginning to end, one author that wasn't. Yeah. It's Dr. Luke. <laughs> he is a doctor, yes. <laughs> Everybody wants their sense, but all Jewish moments yeah, want their sense. <laughs> a doctor or a lawyer. Right, right. <laughs> right Janet? <laughs> yeah. 
But verse 2 says that it was until the day that he was taken up to heaven after he had given orders by, and he doesn't say by himself. He didn't say, I'm giving the orders. He said the orders are by the real Hakodesh. The orders are by the Holy Spirit. And once again, we see our triunity because Yeshua said, I came to do the will of the Father. I speak what the Father gives me to say. And now he's saying it's by the power of the Spirit. And here he is claiming to be God himself also. So once again, we've got our triunity. Once again, we see Yochanan John 6.38 was that, that he came to do the will of the Father. Now he's doing the will of the Spirit, and he is the one who is equal, so he can do and be. Verses 3 through 8, though, back in Acts, say, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. He proved it again and again and again. He didn't just show up once. He showed up here. He showed up there. He showed up to one. He showed up to 12. He showed up to over what, over, Five. over 500 by the time our count is yes. done. You take 500 eyewitnesses in a court and you win what your 500 eyewitnesses said happened. And by the way, have you ever heard 500 agree? Right. <laughs> in New York. <laughs> in New York? <laughs> okay. Well, he's convincing Cruz, he convinced them over a period of 40 days, and he's speaking things regarding the kingdom of God. Now, that shouldn't be anything strange. The kingdom of God is what's been promised to the Jewish nation. He is talking to the Jewish people. He's still working with the Jewish nation, and he's still promising them that coming kingdom. It's not all over, it's not off, and it's not given to somebody else. It belongs to Israel. Verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them, don't leave Jerusalem, but to wait, and they wait for what the Father has promised. Which, he said, you heard it of from me. The Father promised it, you heard it from me. For Yochanan, John baptized you with water, but you'll be baptized with the Ruach HaKodesh not many days from now. He's promising them the Spirit. I see all over this our triune God at work in behalf of these people. Jewish believers, because that's who it starts with. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't exclude. Remember Romans 1.16, it doesn't exclude. Mm -hmm. So verse 6, so when they come together, they began asking him, saying, mm -hmm. Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Once again, oh, kingdom to Israel. Let me put the whole phrase yes. in there, yes. because it's to Israel. It's, are you going to bring the kingdom now to Israel? Mm -hmm. Now, you would think, why are they asking that? Because they're good Jewish boys yep. that have been told again and again and again that that's what is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. This is what's coming. And they know to expect the fulfillment of the promises. Nowhere are they saying, well, it, it, we lost it. It's over. It's been forgotten. No, they were expecting it. And why this would be a good time? Because, because they were being um, oppressed. Yes, the oppression's still going on. Rome is ruling over them. They're not free. They are suffering. And that kingdom it comes with Messiah as king, setting Israel up as head nation, breaking that bond and freeing them in a way that they've not been experiencing. Absolutely. And it, wouldn't you think it would be a good time? Remember Fiddler on the Roof when they have to leave and they go to the rabbi and they say, wouldn't this be a good time for God to come? And he says, well, we have to wait for him someplace else. Yeah. That was the sad answer there. But verse 7, Yeshua <laughs> tells them, he says, it's not for you to know the periods of time or the appointed time. So I love it because if he told them it's not going to be for a couple thousand years, <laughs> they, oh, well then, <laughs> they just give up. <laughs> That's why God shields from us what we don't know about our future because we wouldn't handle it in the right way. And if he told you something isn't coming for a while, what are you going to do that you're supposed to do for it? Oh, well, I've got time. Yeah. I'll, 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 you know, I'll get to that. I'll get to that tomorrow. You know, I've still got time. So in his wisdom he shielded them from knowing that but he tells them those times that's in the authority of the father but then he says what's so key remember these are his last words to them he knows he's going to be leaving them it had to have been very hard on his heart because he loved them and he walked with them and talked with them and he ate with them drank with them guided them poured himself into them and so he tells them this is what's going to happen and it's wonderful 
He says, but you'll receive power. I'm not going to leave you in a lurch. I'm not going to leave you wimpy and weak and needy. You'll receive power when the Ruch HaKodesh has come on you. And you know what you're going to do with that power? You're going to go out. You're going to turn the world upside down. You're going to be my witnesses in Yerushalayim, in Yudah, in Shomron, which is Samaria, and as far as the remotest part of the earth. You're going to go do it. Now, if he's telling them they're going to go do it without telling them he's going to give them the power to do it, they'd have a right to say, ah, how can I do that? But he's just told them, here's your tool. This is how it's going to be. I'm going to send my spirit. My spirit's going to empower you. In that power, you're going to go and take this to the world. So in summary, he has said, wait for the Father. Wait for the Father's promise. Then you'll be baptized with the Ruch HaKodesh, and you'll receive power when he's come on you. And in that power, you'll go out and be my witnesses everywhere. Yeshua lived that life. He lived that powerful life. He went everywhere showing the power of our God, of our spirit, of, of the Son himself. He lived in that power. And today we have the opportunity also to do our lives in that power. Amen. Not on our own. Right. We'll never make it, folks. Right. But our parsha, again, when I bring it back to us, how do we stay obedient? How do we keep in line? And there's your whole key in that power. If you try to do it yourself, failure. <laughs> but if you do it in the power of the Spirit, success. Success. Remember, Yeshua was as weak as a human could be. And he nailed it. <laughs> okay. But he did nail it. Because they thought they nailed him and he was nailing it. And remember the curtain in heaven that gets pulled back and is held back, is pinned back by nails. So that we can get around. Yeah. And guess what Yeshua's got to be thinking? Where is he going? And where is the Father? And where did Yeshua come from? So Yeshua's going home. Exactly. And I can only imagine having left the glories of heaven, how hard that must have been. He had to have been excited about going home. And that's why I want to take you real quickly. Read it on your own, but go to Revelation 1. Because Revelation 1 is a description of him at home. Okay, It's not the description of the one who has been crucified. It's the one who is reigning because he is on his throne in heaven now. We'll see that on earth. Verse 1, the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. The revelation of Yeshua Jesus, the Messiah, given by God to him. God gave him. Remember, he spoke what God gave him. He gave it to him to show the bond servants. Who are the bond servants? Yes. We, are. we are. Because we've come into his army. We've signed up for duty. He's brought us in, and he's going to reveal to us. And what does he reveal to us? It starts with him. He reveals himself. Verse 4 says that he's the one who is. He's the one who was. He is the one to come. Verse 5 says he was the firstborn, and that's in rank and position out of the dead. And then it says he's the ruler of the kings of the earth, because we know he's king of kings and lord of lords. And verse 8 says he's the all up in the top. That's your A to Z. He's the beginning. He's the end. And it says that, that he's Adonai Elohim, Lord God. And then it tells us in that same verse, verse 8, it calls him, in your English, Almighty. Mm -hmm. That's El Shaddai. He's mm -hmm. all over this in his glory and his power mm -hmm. and his majesty. And Yochanan is seeing all this. He sees him, the Son of Man, a very messianic title, the Son, capital S, but he took on human form. And Yochanan is seeing him now in all this glory. And you know how he reacts? Mm -hmm. I love it. Do you know what happens to him? He faints. <laughs> it's just so much he can't even handle it. And I think that's us. Yeah. The moment we see the Lord, I think we're just going to fall on our faces yeah. and just right. faint. And, and in that, he's just described him in his priestly garb. Yeah. 
the robe and the sash and all. He's seen him as high priest in heaven. And it was just so much. I mean, his heart just couldn't contain it. And you know who reaches out to him? Yeshua. Yeshua touched him, reassured him, put his hand on him. He said, don't be afraid, Yohanan. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Sha'ol. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yohanan. <laughs> wow. Not only do we have Adonai Elohim, not only do we have El Shaddai, not only do we see the beginning and the end, the one who is, who was, and is to come, we're seeing this huge picture. And then he brings it home. And he says, I'm alive forevermore. I've conquered death. And what's more, I've even taken and the keys of Sha'ol, the place of the... the um, uh, the glory side, the the not the suffering side. There's a word I can't think of it, but the the is Abraham's wisdom. Yes, the place where those who went in faith believing, he emptied it out. He'd taken it to heaven. I can tell you that another time. I can back it up with the scripture if you don't know. But this he has done between his ascension the third day and the, and the ascension that we're seeing now. He's taken, and that's why he says, "I have the keys." You know when you have the keys? You've got the power. Yes. You're the one. That's, right. that's authority. That's power. That's you're the one who has the right to open it or to close it. And he emptied paradise. There's paradise. my word. Yeah, he right. emptied oh. paradise and yeah. he took paradise into heaven because he made the way open. You know why he had to ascend before this point? And he tells Miriam that when he had just resurrected and she's in the garden bawling her eyes out because the one she has loved She's watched him die, and she's broken hearted, and I love, he's on mission, folks. He's got a place to go. He's I've got to send to the Father. So he, he takes that moment, though, and I see it in all the love he had for her. He, he calls her, and he asks her, you know, what, what's, what's wrong? And she's crying. They've taken his body. I don't know where it is. I don't know what to do. And all he says is her name. Mm -hmm. When he says your name, yes. it's like no one else. Yes. It's like no one else. And she realized that in a moment she went from utter defeat to grabbing and wanting to cling to him. And I'm sure she's shouting out, will you praise the Lord, you're alive. <laughs> and he said, but stop clinging. I've got to go to my father. And he tells her, go spread the good news. <laughs> I'll see you again. Yeah. And he went... And he put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Because remember, he's high priest. Yes. He's our high priest. And remember how Yochanan saw him in Revelation 1? In his priestly garments. Do you know what he's doing at the right hand of the Father right now? He's doing the work of the high priest. He's interceding yeah. still for us. But just like we see at Yom Kippur. They sacrifice the animal, but the high priest then takes that blood into the Holy of Holies. He disappears. They can't see him. He disappears in the clouds. You all can read into that because my time is up. He disappears in the clouds. They wait to see him come out to see if they've been accepted or not. Has God forgiven us? Has he covered our sins for another year? And now, with Yeshua putting perfect, sinless, shed blood, human blood, on the mercy seat in heaven, that's why I say that curtain that got ripped, it got pinned back by those nails, because now the way open is there. And now paradise is in heaven, and now to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord that's not in the heart of the earth, that's at the, the, the Lord's at the right hand of the Father. That's a heavenly scene. That's power. That's keys. That's authority. That is... I'm out of words. <laughs> what can I say? Wow. What, wow. <laughs> Hebrews 9.24, For the Messiah has entered a holiest place, the holiest place, which is not man-made, not merely a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, in order to appear now on our behalf in the very presence of God. And the, the complete, or the new American says, in the presence of God, for us. Wow. Oh, what love. What power. What grace. 
he paid it all. It was done. When he said it's finished, it was paid. But do you see the crescendo? Do you see how because it was done, the work carries on forever? It doesn't end. It's forever. We are eternally saved when we come into that right relationship with him. And Yeshua is saying, and that's how you're going to get empowered. Whoa, wait till next week. Oh, 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 oh. You think we're on a high now? Yeah. Wait till then. Let me just suffice it to say right now. Within our grasp is the same power to live that holy life that Yeshua left. We're not weaklings. We're not wimpy. And we're not on our own. And when he saw them, and he's telling them to go, He's not telling them, go do it on your own. He's saying, you'll go in my power. You'll go in my spirit. But he told them to wait. You know what they did while they waited? I love it. They got together and they prayed. Wow. Wow. What are you doing while you're waiting? Telling Psalm 62.5, my soul waited silence for God alone, for my hope is from him. And I can't leave it here. you got to give me five more minutes. I'll hurry. Is Israel left out then? Where's poor Israel? They don't have that advantage because they don't have the spirit. But remember, God promised, if you return, I will be your God. You will be my people. And back in our parasha, chapter 26, Leviticus, verse 45, but I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, so that I might be their God. I am Adonai. I am Lord. And I bring you a verse that sadly is taken. The principle is there. There's another verse that the Gentile nations should choose, but they choose Israel's, which is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. This was spoken to Israel. Again, the principle's there, and there's another verse. It's in Jeremiah. I'll get you the verse next week. And my people, who are called by my name, when they humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. That's what God has promised. Remember, Messiah stopped with the favorable day of the Lord, the day of salvation. He didn't talk about that vengeance, but there is a day of vengeance coming. There is a time of wrath coming. And the, the, yes, there's a gap in between, and we're in that in between. And sadly, before that second coming, it is going to get worse. And I can quote you verses very quickly. Jeremiah 25 talks about God's wrath being poured out on the whole earth. The whole earth. Yeshia, Isaiah 51, 22, this is what your Lord, Adonai, the Lord your God, who contends for his people, says, Behold, I've taken from your hand the cup of staggering. The chalice of my anger you will never drink again. You know that what that means? That means that they have been drinking yes. in that. Yes. That means they have been yes. suffering. We do have the diaspora. We do have the suffering. We do have hostages. We do have powers over Israel. There are those that are right now crying out for the annihilation of every Jew everywhere. That means us here too. They're not content just with wiping the Jews out of Israel. They want them out of the entire world. Then there will be peace, they say. Yeah, right, hello, I can go off, but I can't. So, uh, but, but God's saying, it's not going to stay that way. Amen. Yes, Amen. you're suffering consequences. Yes, it's going to get worse. Yes, the, even my wrath is going to be poured out, which we haven't seen start yet. But then he's saying, and this is what he's going to do with that cup of the wine of his wrath from his hand in Jeremiah 25, 15. He says he's going to give it to all the nations to whom I send you to drink from it. So the, where the Jew has gone and where they have not been treated right, where they are being put down, God's saying they're the ones that are going to have this cup to drink. And Avadiah, Obadiah 16 says, For just as you drank on my holy mountain, 
all the nations will drink continually. They'll drink to the last drop and become as if they never existed. He's going to wipe out nations who are coming against his people. And he's done it in the past. So don't doubt his word in the future. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14.10 says he, he re referring to the Antichrist, the one who thinks he's all this, puts himself on the throne in the temple to be worshipped as God. He says he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength. It's not diluted in the cup of his, of God's anger. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and that will be forever. Yes, God will justly meet out what is deserved. But again, I ask you the question then, what about today? Are they forsaken today? And let me tell you, not only did we talk about last week that Israel became a nation in a day against all odds, fulfilling Isaiah 66. But we also, against all odds, remember in this week, Tuesday night sundown, we remember a very bloody battle, a very costly battle, a very important battle, a battle that God enabled Israel to win. It's the battle for the reunification of Yerushalayim. Mm -hmm. This is the Six Day War. This is 1967. Mm -hmm. God brought Jerusalem, his city, where his temple will be again and where it was because God said, I've put my name here mm -hmm. and my name will be here forever and they will come up to my holy mountain and they will worship me in my holy mountain. And oh, by the way, you other nations, you get to come up and worship here too. Deuteronomy God, verse 12 and verse 5, that ye shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling. And you shall come there. God chose it. Sorry, folks, it's not Utah. And it's not anywhere else. <laughs> it's Yerushalayim, comma, Israel. Telling Psalm 147, verse 2, Adonai builds up or is rebuilding Yerushalayim. He gathers the outcasts, the exile, the dispersed. He gathers those of Israel. That's what's happening. And I don't know how Janet and some of the others feel right now, our other Janet too, but I could feel very much an outcast right now mm -hmm. because of the way this world mm -hmm. refers to me. Mm -hmm. What's his purpose? Tehillim Psalm 132, 13, and 14. For the Lord has chosen Zion. Zion's a name for Yerushalayim. It's a name for all of Israel, but specifically Yerushalayim. He has chosen Zion. He has desired it as his dwelling place. And verse 14 says, this is my, God speaking, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. So all of you who want to give that to Hamas or to an Arab population who want to say that's theirs, I have news for you. <laughs> God says it's mine, and I'm putting my treasure there. And I could give you all kinds of political. I could give you the fact that Israel bought 70% of that land before 1948. But I'll take you all the way back to God's word because it really doesn't matter what else is what God says. And in Micah, Micah 4, 2, he says, come, let's go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of God of Yaakov. He will teach us about his ways and we'll walk in his paths for out of Zion will go forth Torah, the word of Adonai from Yerushalayim. God hasn't forgotten, and he isn't missing, and it isn't not going to happen. In fact, God has over 800 times in our scriptures referred to Yerushalayim. 660 of them in the original covenant alone, but it's also in the new covenant. Why is that place so important? That's the place where Abraham nearly offered up Yitzhak. That's the place described by Moshe to the children of Israel by command of God. It's the place where David reigned. It's the place where his son Shlomo built the temple. It's where the Holy of Holies was established. It's where God said, I'll dwell with my people. And it's 
what David, David bought mm -hmm. from the Jebusites because he wouldn't take mm -hmm. and then give to the Lord. He <coughs> bought it. Mm -hmm. What does that reunification have to do? Is God's faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, mm -hmm. I will bring them back. Mm -hmm. But he's also saying each one can be empowered by my spirit. Mm -hmm. So you can go out to the world, take my message out, and then come back home. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is the plan of our God. He has chosen to put his name on that land forever. Mm -hmm. And in his faithfulness, mm -hmm. it will be. Be done. Yes. You know how God looks Amen. at time? Amen. He looks at it done. He yeah. sees it already done. Already done. We're just catching up, folks. <laughs> so in your struggles today, in your time of waiting, I encourage you, wait on the Lord. Wait in prayer. Wait in His Word. And whatever you are facing, God will empower you with His Spirit. And you will not have failure. You will have success. Amen. What a word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wait till next week. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till next week.